platformers dominated fourth and fifth generation consoles. Whether you were playing Rayman and Crash Bandicoot over on the PlayStation 1 like me, or Super Mario and Donkey Kong over on the Nintendo side of things, it's safe to say the genre is largely responsible for introducing many of us to the entire medium of video games. I mean, hell, where would I be today if I didn't spend so many nights as an eight-year-old staying up until 10 or, God forbid, 11 p.m. trying to perfect rope walk in the high road or breaking yet another replacement Mad Cats controller because I missed just one box. However, as we began shifting into the much more powerful sixth generation consoles like the PS2 and Xbox, things began getting much more complicated. Many platforming giants like the aforementioned Crash Bandicoot began losing their footing on new ground as they held too tightly to old ideas and poorly implemented new ones. Meanwhile, fresh IP like Jack and Daxter, Sly Cooper, and Ratchet and Clank managed to make the most of this new tech and deservedly held the platforming spotlight throughout the entire generation. But I'm not here to bore you with successful games. I know my audience. Y'all are just like me. Success is fucking boring. I want to talk about games that you maybe rented at Blockbuster once and forgot about for 20 years until you saw this video. So that is what I aim to do today. To do today, to do today. <laughs> but before we find out how well I've managed to pull this off, I want to take a quick moment to discuss today's sponsor, me. I just launched a new series over on my second channel, Maddie Mortuary, where I sit down with other creators, and the first episode just launched, featuring one of my favorite YouTubers, Ruby Falls, where we build a PS2 starter pack. This series will be kind of like a podcast, but more focused around one topic or activity, so that I don't have to admit that I'm another white guy named Matt who has a podcast. It's not a podcast. I also have a Discord, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. So check all of that out at the link below the like button if any of that sounds interesting to you. But for right now, let's get back to the video. The only thing worse than a short-lived trend is catching onto that trend a little too late and showing up to the party looking foolish because everybody has already moved on to the next thing and you're still wearing trip pants. You should fit my grandma. She's dead. <laughs> Good one. That was literally the fate for 2004's Malice, a unique little platforming adventure that would be one of the final releases for Star Fox, Croc, and Alien Resurrection developer Agronaut Games. What makes Malice so special is ironically one of the things that made it so unappealing upon release, which is Malice's badass 2000's new metal drip. I'm talking big pants, a little top, fat skate shoes, pigtails with bangs, and a tribal tramp stamp. You are the, the epitome of everything I have ever looked for in another human being. Sure, it might not be the best game in the world, what with the floaty combat, mediocre level design, and clunky game mechanics, but hey, you get to finally hang out with the girl all the bad guys want. I'm the goddess of kicking monstrous butt is what? You want some tree boy? As legendary as that sounds, however, unfortunately the game just doesn't feel that good to play. And as a dude who owns way more butt rock CDs than I should admit, that is a real fucking bummer. Everything feels a bit floaty, weightless, and slow, which is most apparent in the game's unwieldy combat, which manages to feel simultaneously too heavy and too light. The giant club, which will eventually become a giant hammer, is fun for for a bit, but the issue is that you push enemies away from you upon landing an attack, causing an unfortunate combat loop of hitting an enemy, thus pushing them away from you, walking a few steps, hitting them again, repeat. The game had an incredibly problematic development cycle, having first been announced in 2000, with Gwen Stefani originally being cast in the game's titular role. Don't call me mother, just call me Malice. But after going through multiple publishers, losing contracts, and getting fucked about for four years, the game would eventually roll out to mediocre reviews, little to no advertising, and of course, land just a year or so after Limp Bizkit murdered new metal culture with their cover of Behind Blue Eyes. All of this, falling apart like this, is on you. Oh, Limp Bizkit. First it giveth, then it taketh away. 
While we're on the topic of games reminiscent of a specific time and place, remember the days when Cartoon Network and WB were putting out kind of weird, more surreal, and dare I say edgy alternatives to the more accessible shows found on Nickelodeon? Return the slab. Our next game is maybe one of the ultimate throwbacks to this era of animation, and that is Midway's 2002 Dr. Muto. The final game to be directed by retired asteroid Centipede and Super Breakout designer Ed Log, Dr. Muto follows the titular main character after his planet, named Planet Midway, is destroyed by a rival evil scientist, and he's forced to create a new device that will rebuild the world around him. Now, by this time, the evil genius trope was already beginning to overstay its welcome. Between Neo Cortex, Invader Zim, Professor Calamitous, Dexter, and many, many more, it was far from the most exciting archetype they could have possibly gone with in the early 2000s, but somehow Dr. Muto presents us with a character I actually find kind of refreshing and exciting, even if he's not really doing that much new with the character. He's still a caricature, he's the butt of every joke, but there's always just a little bit of extra spice. Like we've seen a protagonist do a victory dance at the end of a level, but never with that much conviction. The level design is tremendously expansive, and they throw literally everything at you in level Levels I figured would be ending at any time, but ended up going on and on for sometimes hours without losing steam or running out of ideas. Dr. Muto mixes things up with enemies that vary greatly in both appearance and combat, areas being filled with numerous different challenges, and of course, with Dr. Muto's abilities, which see us turning into different creatures, like a rat that can get through smaller, often hidden doorways, or a giant ape who can Hulk smash enemies and swing around from nets and monkey bars, Dr. Muto has everything a 90s kid suffering from Cartoon Network brain rot could ever ask for. A main character you can root for and laugh at, some of the best animation and cutscene direction of the generation, puzzles that aren't too hard but are still satisfying, pitbull battle bots, this game has it all. Earlier we spoke about how some games coming into this generation like Crash Bandicoot didn't really know how to pivot into the 3D landscape without losing its identity and Dr. Muto is an incredible example of how far you can take things without the shackles of the past holding you back. And I highly recommend it. Ah, Castle Ween, developed by three different developers for three different ports, which would be published by three different publishers. So it's gotta be good, right? I mean, listen to how cute the character voices are. It's like a Tulip Halloween special. No, this game is too fucking hard. You might not be able to tell at first, but this children's game where you play as two different children with different powers and, oh, look, they're so adorable. Oh, look, she's got a little hat on is one of the hardest, most frustrating platformers I've ever played. Castleween, or Spirits and Spells, depending on the release, was the final game developed by French development studio Callisto Entertainment, best known for Nightmare Creatures, The Fifth Element, and Dark Earth. It's a spooky little platformer where you switch between playing as a brother and sister with different abilities as you traverse family-friendly spooky locale. The art design is great, the music especially is really good, reminds me a lot of Medieval, and I was very intrigued when I first picked this up. Remember the terminally underrated game 40 Winks about the brother and sister exploring nightmares on the PlayStation 1? Okay, so imagine a game like that, but with about as much room for error as brain surgery, which normally I would be okay with. I love a challenge, but if you're gonna be unforgiving in a game, I expect your gameplay to be tight, and Castle Ween is fucking loose. There's no camera control, the hitboxes are about as wobbly as a pair of trucks on a Walmart skateboard, and to make things even worse, there's a level early on that is so reminiscent of Tomb of the Giants from Dark Souls, I wanted to fillet a shotgun. Yum. As I mentioned, the game allows you to switch between characters, but only by using limited items, and when you die, you do not get those items back. So you can wind up at a section that requires Greg, but you've switched too many times between the characters along the way, and now you can't switch when you need to. So, good luck? One interesting note about Castle Ween is that while I may have my problems with the 3D versions of the game, there's also a Game Boy Advance version, which I honestly really love. They replace the item 
items to switch between characters with designated times and where you switch back and forth when necessary. They retain all the enemy types but make the whole game feel a lot tighter. The music still kicks ass but in that kind of violent bit crush GBA sound chip kind of way. And when you find out the developers behind the GBA version are Magic Pocket, the team responsible for a truckload of great ports such as Road Rash Jailbreak, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, and Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, it begins making a lot more sense why this version of the game is great at best, but totally serviceable at worst. Pour one out for the legends that made Nightmare Creatures, because even when it's bad, it's still remarkably interesting, and all jokes aside, Callisto absolutely deserved better than to be told the GBA version of their game is actually better than their version of the game. That's really fucked up. When talking about great tie-in games, or even going online to look up great tie-in games to refresh our memories, we often see a lot of the same stuff. 007, Batman, Harry Potter, all the great SpongeBob games of which there are an inordinate amount of. What did this time do without you, SpongeBob? But one franchise that always gets the short end of the stick or is left out entirely is Scooby-Doo. In particular, the PS2 run, which in my opinion, the best of is Night of a Hundred Frights. Now I'm not trying to rewrite history here or say that this game is obscure because it is true that it was a smash hit for the time, even getting an ugly greatest hits re-release sometime later. But for one reason or another, it did not manage to hold on to its legacy the way that many others have. And that's tragic because Scooby-Doo, fuck. You've got all your favorite Scooby-Doo trappings like sound effects made by real instruments, a laugh track, campy and spooky locations, callbacks to enemies we've seen in the past, creepers, it's the creeper. but most importantly, the unshakable friendship between a stoner and his dog. Okay, but sure, it's Scooby-Doo. No, it's not just Scooby-Doo. This is Zombie Island era Scooby-Doo. That means we have the actors who played Shaggy, Scooby, Velma, and Fred basically throughout the entire 90s and 2000s all returning for this little slice of platforming paradise. Oh, the story is, uh, you're in an old mansion and you're solving a mystery. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Look at him go! We all love a fun and varied platformer, but what about one that puts a real emphasis on linear non-linearity and exploration? A game that almost immediately gives you the keys to like four levels and puts the responsibility on you to explore each one to determine the order in which to do things. For example, you go to the manor, you can't progress because you need springs to put on Scoob's little Frito feet, so you go to the docks, you find the springs, but you need special anti-slip shoes for crews to get through the rest of the docks, so you go back to the manor and voila, more of the manor to progress through. It's a Scooboidvania. We get to swing around on basically anything nailed to the ceiling, avoid obstacles like falling boulders. Hey, remember when every game had falling boulders in them? What happened to that? We need the gaming industry to talk less about culture war bullshit and talk more about boulders. I miss boulders, dog. I guess if there was any words of warning I could levy against the game, they would be about how occasionally time consuming the exploration can get, which can see you aimlessly wandering around areas you've already been wandering through because you're trying to figure out where to go next. But hey, it's a children's game, kiddo. Get All I knew about this next game is that it was a weird, obscure platformer. I found the ROM, booted it up, and got this. Stretch Panic, also known as Freak Out and Hippolinda, was developed by the legendary developer Treasure, who I am very embarrassed to admit I had never heard of before making this video. Famous as a studio who would never compromise their vision to make safe, commercially friendly hits that follow popular trends, Treasure has always managed to make whatever the hell they wanted and honestly seemed to take no shit from anyone. Whether they were making a one-off new IP like Rakugaki Showtime, Sin and Punishment, Gunstar Heroes, or playing around in more established properties like uh, McDonald's? Treasure saw their own vision through to the end, which is pretty fucking apparent here. With music that sounds like something you would only hear in Mario's Nightmares.
disorienting visual effects, fever dream big titty bitches whose giant milkers can transform into helicopter blades, and a control scheme that doesn't use action buttons. This is very obviously one of those crazy games on the PS2 that was all about coulda and maybe not so much about shoulda, which is what I would say if the game wasn't actually kind of genius in a warped, horny, hallucinogenic, Jodorowskian kind of way. You see, what makes this game special well, one of the things that makes this game special is your ability to pinch literally any surface in the game, flick your right analog stick, and fling yourself to the next platform, thus making it a platformer, I guess. The pinch mechanic is also how you deal damage to enemies, which you'll be doing a lot of, as believe it or not, this game is actually essentially a boss rush with little platforming areas in between that you use to pinch points and unlock more bosses. And yeah, of course, the bosses are a total mind melt, all of which which do completely different attacks and force you to find the strategy to each one with nothing more than a right analog stick. And what's crazier than all of that, this game actually works. Once you've played through the game enough, consequently melting that gray matter in your head you used to call a brain down to a malleable sludge, it actually becomes a really fun, puzzling, and endlessly endearing game about a girl who has to use a demonic scarf to exercise her family after they are possessed by demons. You know, that old chestnut. Taylor's old as time. And that's not just a backstory either. Every piece of code in this dementia simulator is dripping with lore. Yeah. Yeah, go check out the fandom page. Go ahead. I fucking dare you. You'll never be seen again. But that's it for today, everybody. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Make sure to subscribe for more content like this, as well as my series where I cover every single PS2 horror game. Shout out to Patreon subscribers, Mr. Nobody and Hot Antonio, as well as YouTube member Raccoon Peddler. Thank you all so much, and I'll smell you later.